Centropa was created to provide a platform for Holocaust survivors in 15 European countries to tell us about their lives and mostly through their family pictures. Since these are personal stories, they're not meant to provide our readers with an historical overview. One could say these stories are not about 20th century history per se, they're about what the 20th century did to the people we interviewed. Generally speaking, we know less about the Sephardic Jewish communities of Southeast Europe than we do about Jewish communities of, for instance, Germany and Poland. And during the Second World War, Turkey remained neutral and lies outside the scope of our topic. The Nazis invaded Yugoslavia and Greece in March of 1941, and their Jewish communities were horribly decimated. The story of Bulgaria and the Holocaust is a complex one, and although not well known, remains a point of controversy to this day. In the online study guide for our Bulgarian films, you'll find links to various books and essays that espouse one view or the other. Our three personal stories, all of which will take you back into the Sephardic world of the pre-war Balkans, are from Larry and Rosa Ansel, Leontina Arditi, and Matilda Albuhar. Here is what we begin with. When the Second World War started, around 48,000 Jews lived in Bulgaria. When the war ended, nearly all of them were still alive. They had not been deported to the Nazi death camps in Poland. The government had refused to comply. Was this a rescue? Some say yes. Others say emphatically not. As Angel Wagenstein, a Bulgarian Jew, said, we were raped, not murdered, but you don't thank someone for raping you. Now here's the background to the story. The Jews of Bulgaria were nearly all Sephardic Jews. Many of them trace their roots back to the Spanish expulsion in 1492, a few even earlier. For nearly 500 years, Bulgaria itself was under Ottoman occupation, and the Ottomans were, compared to the Christian rulers to the north, far more tolerant toward their Jewish subjects. Bulgarian Jews made up only a tiny minority of the country, less than even 1%. There were very few wealthy Jews. Most were as poor as their neighbors in this relatively poor country. As we hear in all three of our stories, these Bulgarian Jews said they felt very little anti-Semitism while growing up in Bulgaria, which also had a large percentage of Muslims, Armenian Christians, Bulgarian Orthodox, Roma, and Tartars. We also learned that Larry was taken into forced labor during the war, Rosa and her family were deported from Sofia to a small village, and Matilda tells us the remarkable story that she and her father, in March 1943, waited in the town of Burgas to be deported, and for some reason, the deportation order was canceled. Matilda does not provide us with any context for this story, since as an elderly woman recounting her childhood, she would have not really known what was going on. So now, let us unwrap this very complex story. Bulgaria under King Boris III was not a totalitarian state, as was, for example, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Although Boris ruled as a dictator in 1935, historians Esther Benbassa and Aaron Rodriga tell us in their book, The Jews of the Balkans, that parliament continued to function, as did its political parties. Further, Bulgaria was never occupied by the Germans. Bulgaria was an ally and Germany was Bulgaria's most important trading partner. Germany put pressure on Bulgaria to pass laws against its Jews. In October 1940, the law of the protection of the nation was brought before Parliament. Intellectuals in the Bulgarian Orthodox Church were vigorously against it, as were the Bar Association and the Medical Association. But the law did pass in February 1941. And in January 1942, after the Vance Conference in Berlin, the Germans began pressuring the Bulgarians to deport their Jews to the death camps they had set up in Nazi-occupied Poland. June 1942 saw the passing of laws in Bulgaria that forced Jews to wear yellow stars, which Leontina Arditi and Matilda Albuheri tell us about. Economic restrictions against Jews began, and by this time, many Jewish families had become destitute. In the fall of 1942, 
The Germans exerted yet more pressure for deportation, and in February 1943, Alexander Belev of the Bulgarian Interior Ministry agreed to deport 20,000 Jews. He knew what their fate was going to be. As we have seen, two years before this, Nazi Germany had invaded Yugoslavia, then Greece. Because Bulgaria had been an ally of Germany, it received Macedonia from Yugoslavia and Thrace from Greece. Around 12,000 Jews lived in these territories occupied by Bulgaria, and they were marked for destruction. The Bulgarian government, through its police, rounded up and deported around 7,300 Jews of Macedonia and deported them to the Nazi death camp of Treblinka in occupied Poland. Almost none returned. In Larry Ansel's film, he tells us that while he was in forced labor, he watched a train of Greek Jews being taken through Bulgaria by train. Those would have been the ones from Thrace. Around 4,000 Jews were on those transports, which were also headed for Treblinka. Not one person from those transports survived. Belev had now deported 12,000 of his promised 20,000 Jews. He needed another 8,000, and he turned to the Jews of historic Bulgaria. The historian Michael Bar Zohar tells us that Belev's own secretary was secreting out information to Jewish friends about what was about to happen to them. And we know that a small contingent of Jews from the town of Kustendil went to visit Dimitar Peshev, a member of parliament. Peshev, according to Benbasa and Rodriga, as well as the historian Setan Todorov, worked with 42 other members of parliament who signed a protest against the deportation. But the deportations were slated to go ahead on March the 9th anyway. On this day, Jews were indeed gathered up in the town squares in many cities, but in several places, there were protests against the deportations. In Plovdiv, for instance, the Metropolitan of the Orthodox Church stormed into the square where the Jews had been gathered and demanded from the police that the order be rescinded. In Burgas, Matilda Albuher remembers waiting with all of their goods in the town square and they were waiting to be taken away, but the mayor himself protested to the government in Sofia. And then by late afternoon, the message came from Sofia. The deportation order had been rescinded. So far, this does sound like a rescue. But our story does not end there, as two months later, in May 1943, the Bulgarian Interior Ministry, still under pressure from Germany to deport the Jews to the Nazi death camps, presented King Boris with a plan to either deport 20,000 Jews from Sofia out of the country or to the provinces of Bulgaria. Boris signed the second option, and the Jews of Sofia were sent out to the provinces. They lived in small villages in incredibly crowded conditions, and Rosa Anschel tells us about them. During this time, around 7,000 Jewish men were conscripted into forced labor. Some of their Bulgarian overseers acted like beasts, and Leontina Arditi tells us of how her father had been beaten mercilessly. Other overseers had acted more humanely. But this was forced labor, and for the most part, it was brutal, although the Ansels tell us that Larry was allowed to leave his brigade to go and marry Rosa and Rose's father received permission from his overseer to attend the same wedding, so the record seems to be somewhat mixed. By September 1944, the Soviet army swept through Romania and liberated Bulgaria. The Bulgarian army changed sides, declared war on Germany, and then fought alongside the Soviet army until the war ended in 1945, in May. Yes, Bulgaria's Jews had survived the war, but the anti-Jewish laws in Bulgaria had ruined them, so much so that nearly half of all the Jews were dependent on soup kitchens just to stay alive. Little wonder, then, that when a new Jewish state was declared in the Middle East, Israel, well more than 90% of Bulgaria's Jews emigrated in search of a better life. That story lies outside the scope of this one, and now let us turn to Dr. Albana Tanova, a Holocaust specialist in Bulgaria today. As we know, the Bulgarian government had no compunction about sending the Jews of Thrace and Macedonia to their deaths, and that same government was willing to deport its own Jewish citizens. Historians continue to discuss just who was responsible for halting the deportations. Most agree it was a combination of decisions that were interlinked with each other. 
But when Albina Tanova stands in the classroom of young Bulgarians, she presents a different view. It was your grandparents who saved Bulgaria's Jews from deportation, she tells them. Ordinary people had come out onto the street and protested. Ordinary people had said it was wrong. Religious people and communists too. And they all went out on the street to say so. So whether the story of Bulgaria's Jews during the Holocaust was a rescue or not is almost secondary in this case. What is important is the role that civil society played in this multi-ethnic society not very long ago.